Good evening, I'm Jake Ward coming to you from the NBC News Bureau here in San Francisco. Here are some of the stories we are following now tonight. Endless storms, the onslaught of severe weather battering California is causing flooding and mudslides. Millions are under flood watch and thousands have already opted to flee their homes. The slide last night was huge. I say we got stopped by that and it was a couple hundred feet high. Classified document dilemma. Sources tell NBC News less than a dozen classified documents were found in an office used by President Biden. How this development has some Republicans up in arms. We need to have a serious investigation into this. I'll echo again, uh, impeach Biden, and that's what we need to do. Okay. Chat GPT 101. Remember the days when you spent hours in a library researching and writing a paper for school? Well, that could be over. We'll get into why software called ChatGPT may be the death of the college essay. And Globes controversy. The Golden Globes are tonight, but somehow in the year 2023, we are still talking about diversity in these awards shows or lack thereof. We begin tonight with a climate catastrophe here in California. Torrential downpours and back-to-back -back storms are unleashing a deluge throughout the state. Here is the reality. The ground in California is completely saturated and it cannot hold on to all the rain. It's causing mudslides. Rocks and boulders are falling from hillsides. Rivers that rarely even rise are spilling over their banks. And at least 17 people have died. Governor Gavin Newsom Poor damage in Santa Cruz County this afternoon, asking Californians to listen to emergency orders. He said these kinds of storms, so-called atmospheric rivers, are getting stronger. So I was out there a couple days ago uh, and went in other places where we were doing more sandbagging around the levees uh, and more prevention. Of course, all the prevention in the world, Mother Nature's fury. She bats last, bats a thousand. Uh, and that's what we're up against, this new reality and uh, it's going to require us to be more flexible and more resourceful. In Paso Robles, search and rescue teams are searching again for a missing five-year-old boy swept away by floods. His mother was rescued after her truck got stuck in rising waters. Now, a dive team, a drone team, and helicopter are helping look for the boy. And in Southern California, the ground is washing away under people's feet. The storm caused a massive sinkhole in Chatsworth, swallowing two cars and four people this morning. You can see crews there using ropes and ladders to pull two of them to safety. Joining us now is NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer. He's reporting from Chatsworth, just north of Los Angeles. Uh, Miguel, give us a sense of the state's response on the ground where you are. Well, Jacob, the state is really going to have its work cut out for them. They have projects they're going to have to fix and repair for the several weeks, if not months ahead. You can see that massive sinkhole behind me. It actually swallowed two cars. People in those, both those cars plummeted at about 35 feet down. Everyone made it out alive with the help of first responders. But this storm has also been deadly. More than 17, at least 17 people up and down the state have died. There's massive cleanup works to be done all along the coastline. Trees in the Sacramento area, in the Bay Area are also down. Power was out to about 200,000 people earlier today. They've got a lot of work ahead, a massive cleanup ahead, Jake. It makes my palms sweat to just see the size of the hole behind you there, Miguel. And, you know, our, we've obviously been paying close attention to the events of the last days and, and weeks, but, but I just have to ask, I mean, is this the new normal for California? What's your understanding of that? Well, it certainly seems like that, Jake. You know, you're a resident here. You know we have those extreme droughts. We have those mega fires. And now we've got this incredible dumping deluge, which has been going on since just before the start of the new year. We spoke to scientists who say Californians should get used to these extremes. Here's what one expert told us earlier today. We have seen the hottest years in history over the last eight years. And that means that we're seeing extremes on both sides, extreme drought and extreme wildfires and extreme rainfall and that's just because the atmosphere can hold more moisture and so these atmospheric rivers coming from the tropics are forming in a way that we haven't seen before now all of these extremes are leading to massive disasters disasters that cost in the billions of dollars to repair which we were just talking about jake so clearly there's a huge price tag and a huge climate impact from these storms jake 
And, and looking, Miguel, at you know the coming couple of weeks, as I understand it, there are more storms on the way. I mean, how are emergency crews supposed to keep up with the ongoing cycle of rain and mud and rain and mud? It's a great question. We've already had six atmospheric rivers. We have at least two more storms that are brewing off California's coast. Some of them have been Pineapple Expresses. These are storms that carry a torrential amount of rain. People have been getting sandbags, refilling those sandbags, coming back and forth to their homes. People are trying to fortify as best they can. We had a massive storm here in Los Angeles, which, as you know, rarely gets rain just over New Year's. And then everyone was saying that was the largest storm we had seen in such a long time. But this one we just had overnight was even bigger. So, Jake, who knows where the next one will go? NBC's Miguel Almaguer staring down the barrel of all this damage for us. Miguel, thank you. Let's now bring in Brian Ferguson. He is the Deputy Director for Crisis Communications and Public Affairs at the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Brian, at this hour, we're looking at at least two more storms on the way. More than 100,000 people are without power. What are the priorities of the Office of Emergency Services now? Yeah, we find ourselves in a very dynamic and dangerous time. We've been flying rescue missions with state and federal resources throughout the day. Uh, these floods and mudslides have had impacted up and down our state from Los Angeles all the way up to San Francisco and beyond. Uh, the folks behind us in this room have been working 24 hours a day. Um, however, we understand that we are not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination, and there is multiple storms coming behind. So life-saving work happening now and preparation for the future and ultimately goal to keep Californians safe. Hey, Brian, you know, do you have what you need at this hour to get to people who, you know, for whatever reason, whether because of physical ability or financial limitations or age, cannot get out on their own? Are you able to evacuate everyone who needs to go? Yeah, with the resources brought by President Biden, who's been in almost constant communication with Governor Newsom, we, we have significant augmentation in terms of our air assets, our personnel from the Coast Guard, the military, as well as the thousands of first responders we have here in our state. The factor that we can continue to struggle with and that we're encouraging people in our state to think about is the human behavior element. We have, uh, unfortunately, have seen a number of fatalities where people have not heeded direction from first responders, not evacuated or driven around areas that were closed. And uh, our death toll, unfortunately, continues to rise. And our goal is to really get the word out to Californians that their behavior and their actions uh, have real world impacts. And, you know, we want them to evacuate early, listen to directions and ultimately keep themselves and their families safe. Well, and of course, Brian, so much of that behavior comes from the fact that, you know, all of us who live here in California are really surprised by what is going on here. But of course, we're we're seeing uh, experts tell us again and again that this is the new normal. We may very well see these more extreme storms. I guess I'm wondering, from your perspective, is the state ready to adapt? How can we adapt our infrastructure, which has been flooded, or, you know, our streets, which can't obviously handle this? I mean, how are we going to adapt as a state to this new normal? We are absolutely experiencing a whiplash in weather. We've had four consecutive years of very uh, dry, drought-like conditions, and now that it's raining with that, that rain we need so much, it's all coming at the same time as this atmospheric river barrels across our state. Um, goal continues to be the life-saving efforts and also helping people understand who may not have experienced a flood like this, at least in the past five years, perhaps longer. Floods are actually the, the deadliest disaster in our, in our state, uh, you know, in a wildfire, you can see it coming. It's a, a little bit different. And those are the disasters we've had in recent years and really trying to help the public understand what they can do while also evaluating how can we up our game, how we can utilize technology, uh, and what are the skills and tools that we need to keep people safe in this new challenging environment. And Brian, you know, I, I think about the dream of California as being the dream of living where you want. And yet we've seen natural disasters challenge that concept, right? Wildfires have taught us that you cannot live anywhere you want to in the forest. And it feels like the events of the last week or so have taught us that you cannot maybe dream, have that dream house right on the beach the way we had assumed. Do you think that we are entering an era where we're going to have to make, I don't know if this is the word, but more mature decisions about where we choose to live here in the Golden State? 
You know, they, they, they've said for decades that California is like the rest of the nation, only more so. And that applies to weather and disasters as well. And, you know, we do believe Californians can live and have that dream. It just takes that preparation, that thought process, maybe hardening their homes, being more prepared and, you know, being willing to get out early. Uh, we have new technology. We have the ability to monitor these storms in ways we haven't in the past. And we're trying to put that to use here um, and ultimately get people in our state to a safer place. Brian Ferguson of the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, thank you so much. Thank you. And California is not in the clear just yet. Check out this time lapse of storms slamming into the West Coast. This is from a NOAA satellite over the past four days. You can see the days peel by and storm after storm pummel east. There, there is more to come. More storms are set to slam into parts of the state this week. And that is, of course, when we turn to NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, give us a sense of the lineup here. What do the coming days look like? Oh, we need a break. We're not going to get an extended break, but at least if we can get a little more spacing between these storms, we can get some of the river levels down, the ground can dry out a little bit so that we can absorb more the next time the storm moves in. So today we didn't have the pouring rain like we did yesterday with all the horrific scenes that we saw with all the rescues. We had more scattered showers and thunderstorms that moved through the region. So again, more water. We had isolated flash flooding, but not widespread. But all these bright white clouds, this is already the next storm that'll be coming in tomorrow. And what's the only good news about this one is that this does not look like it's going to head directly into the areas that were hardest hit yesterday. L.A., Santa Barbara, all the way up to Santa Cruz. We're stopping this at 6 p.m. tomorrow night, and it's really from the Bay Area northwards, and especially the North Bay. We're talking Napa to Eureka, Redding, Fort Bragg area. That's where we're going to see the one to three inches of rain, maybe isolated in some of the higher elevations, five inches. That'll be problematic, but this is not the area that was hit with heavy rain yesterday, so they should be able to absorb it a little better. There will be issues. There there will be lobbying landslides. There will be some debris flows of the burn scars. There will be some isolated flash flooding, but not in the same areas that just had it. And some of this rain will actually head to the north. Then as we go into Thursday, it looks like we get a little bit of a break throughout much of the day in California. Yes, it's going to rain in Oregon in the northwest. And even into Friday, this rain stays off the coast. It's not until Saturday that we're going to watch, Jake, the heavy rain returning. That looks like the next significant storm for California will be Saturday afternoon into Saturday night. And Bill, what's so crazy, right, is that the, the, the ground is already waterlogged. Uh, we, and so I guess I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, uh, other than through the basements and living rooms of millions <laughs> of Californians, where does all of this water wind up going? Well, and we have capture methods. I mean, California would love to collect and capture as much of this rainfall as possible. And we have our reservoir systems for that and all the dams that they've built. And those are filling up. Um, on average right now, we're about where we should be for this time of year, historically, which is great because we were so far behind. So that's good. We're filling the reservoirs. But a lot of that water goes the runoff into the rivers, does damage, and then it heads out to sea. It doesn't absorb into the aquifers. And that's why we've had so many flooding concerns. That's why we still have areas of flood warnings, even though it hasn't even rained that much in these areas during the day today. So the additional rainfall with this next storm, this is that one to three isolated up to five inches. The Sierra will get some more snow out of this one, especially since it's a little colder. The snow levels have dropped and it's San Francisco northwards. That's where we'll be collecting the water. Uh, areas to the south around Santa Cruz, we could still see half inch to an inch shake, but I don't think it's going to be enough to cause the significant issues like we just got done with. And then by the time we're talking Saturday, the next significant rainfall, that's going to be five days. So all of the rivers should be totally back where they should be by then. Uh, I think we've seen the worst in this string of storms in California. At least that's my hope right now. NBC's Bill Karens keeping an eye on the new normal here and across the country. Bill, thank you so much. Next, we're talking about classified documents. And no, not the ones at Mar-a-Lago. This time related to President Biden. Plus, a report from Mexico. What Biden, Trudeau and Obrador discussed at the Three Amigos Summit. Now tonight is just getting started. Tonight we're learning more details about the classified documents found at an office that was used 
by President Biden. Here's what we know so far. Sources tell NBC News the documents, which are from the Obama-Biden administration, were found in a locked closet at the Penn Biden Center in Washington, D.C. President Biden used that office between his time as vice president and his campaign for president in 2020. The documents were found on November 2nd, just six days before the midterm elections. The White House says they alerted the National Archives the same day they were found. However, much remains unclear, like what the documents contain and why we're just finding out about them now. Just moments ago, the president addressed the classified documents in Mexico. Here's part of what he had to say. I was briefed about this discovery and surprised to learn that there were any government records that were taken there to that office. But I don't know what's in the documents. I've, my lawyers have not suggested I ask what documents they were. I've turned over the boxes, they've turned over the boxes to the archives, and we're cooperating fully, cooperating fully with the review, and which I hope will be finished soon, and uh, there will be more detail at that time. Joining us now is NBC's justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney. And Ken, as I understand it, the Department of Justice is reviewing this matter. What do we know about that investigation so far? That's right, Jake. That's the review that President Biden was referring to. And what happened was after Biden's lawyers turned the documents over to the National Archives, they referred the matter to the Justice Department. And Attorney General Merrick Garland asked the U.S. attorney in Chicago, who is a Trump appointee, one of two Trump appointee U.S. attorneys remaining, to review this matter to decide whether a criminal investigation is warranted. And our understanding is that that review is ongoing. But President Biden's comments were interesting because the implication uh, was that he had had no idea what these documents were and had never seen them. But if you listen carefully, that's not what he said. And I was thinking mm -hmm. to myself, if, if I had a box of documents from five years ago and someone put it in front of me, I wouldn't know what was in that box either. And I may not remember anything that was in them. That d doesn't mean that he didn't review them at the time. So still mm -hmm. unanswered is the question of how those documents got there. And then, of course, why the White House didn't uh, go public with the discovery uh, when it was made six days before the midterm or even shortly after that, Jake. Yeah, obviously the, the response here will be very carefully choreographed. Seeing the president read it off a piece of paper, you get the sense he's not winging it on, on this one. Now, you know, Ken, at first blush, sort of from a 30,000-foot view, you'd think to yourself, well, there are parallels here. We had one president, President Trump, uh, uh, found to have kept secret documents. Uh, now we're finding that the president followed him, had the same thing going on. Are these things parallel, or do you think that there are important distinctions we should draw here? Jake, there are important distinctions. Of course, uh, there are some parallels. Classified documents in a place they should not have been. And we don't yet know how seriously, uh, how serious the secrets were in the documents that were in President Biden's possession. But in, it's so different from the Trump case where, uh, you know, a grand jury subpoena went out demanding classified documents that they suspected were in Trump's possession. Trump's lawyers told the Justice Department that they had turned over all the classified documents. Then they developed evidence that wasn't true. Then they got a search warrant. A judge had to establish probable cause to believe that a crime had been committed. And so, and, and that's why there are criminal charges being considered in that in that Trump case. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about 300 classified documents, some the highest levels of classification in the government. Whereas in this case. The Biden team self-reported, turned over the right. documents as soon as possible. These kinds of things happen rather routinely, Jake, where documents in the government get to places they shouldn't be, and they're usually not crimes. Mistakes are not crimes. Um, nonetheless, if you're the president whose administration is investigating your opponent over an issue of classified documents, it seems to me you should be scrupulous and transparent if you have mm. a problem with classified documents. And obviously, we'll expect uh, a very strong responses from the Republican uh, side of the aisle uh, going forward. Ken Delaney, and keeping an eye on this for us. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, the president is in Mexico today for the so-called Three Amigos Summit. He's meeting with Canadian President Justin Trudeau and Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador. And the three North American leaders have got their work cut out for them. I mean, among the things they want to accomplish, reducing dependency on China for goods and supplies, the migrant crisis at the border, a surge in gun-related homicides in Mexico, and drug cartels bringing fentanyl to the U.S. and Canada. Joining us now is NBC's White House correspondent Mike Memmoli. You know, Mike, we're going to need these three to get along pretty well if they are going to solve any of these enormous shared problems. Uh, how well did they get along? What's the mood like there? 
Yeah, Jake, you know, it's the right question to ask because whenever we cover these international summits, yes, we're covering what's on paper, right? The agreements they've made, the initiatives that are launched. But as President Biden himself likes to say, all politics, even foreign policy, is personal. So we're always looking closely at sort of how these different leaders interact with one another. And in that respect, there was an interesting contrast just in the span of 24 hours. Yesterday, when President Biden met uh, just one-on-one -on -one with the Mexican president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, Emily as they like to call him here. Uh, AMLO really laid into him. He criticized President mm. Biden and the United States generally for what he called the abandonment of the region, the North America, South America, the hemisphere here. He called the disdain on the part of the United States for not living up to its obligations uh, to support institutions throughout the hemisphere. Well, it was a very different scene today when the two leaders uh, spoke and had this news conference in the afternoon. Uh, AMLO praised the president, called him a, a, somebody mm. who was sincere, who follows through on his commitments, and in fact, he thanked him for, as he put it, being the first president in a matter of uh, years not to build even a meter of new border wall. That spoke to, of course, one of the major challenges here having to do with migration. He acknowledged that when he said that, maybe conservatives back home uh, wouldn't support the president on that. But President Biden also talking about the agreements that have been made among all three and talked about the importance of continuing to work together in the years to come. Well, Mike, obviously, if, if these three were to pull off any one of the many, many uh, to-do items on their list, you know, creating a, a shared uh, community that doesn't need China or fighting off cartel violence or any of these things, I mean, you know, it would just be a historic thing. And we would, of course, rely on you to bring it to us. Uh, what are the next steps that we can expect from a gathering like this? Yeah, it's interesting because, Jake, as the, the commitments that were made here at this summit really are building on commitments uh, that were initially put forward six months ago when President Biden hosted what's called the Summit of the Americas leaders uh, from across the hemisphere, North and South America. And so they're opening, for instance, this portal uh, that is uh, going to be a, a sort of a clearinghouse for those who would like to seek asylum in the U.S. and Canada or Mexico uh, to make it clear what the sort of legal pathways are to try to discourage them from moving here and coming to the border uh, illegally and being turned away, really, as they talked, each of the leaders, all three of them, they focused in their opening remarks today, not on migration specifically, but on the economy broadly, talking about how they all have sort of an obligation to one another and that these problems, all of the intractable problems you laid out, are not as easily solved as our politics might lead to believe. Listen to President Biden as he sort of spoke to that specifically. In today's interconnected world, we cannot wall ourselves off from shared problems. We are stronger and better when we work together, the three of us. And together, we've made enormous progress since our last summit, from COVID fighting COVID-19 and strengthening our ability to address public health threats, to investing in and building a 21st century workforce. So this really was, Jake, a theme that all three of the leaders hit on, that they want to make not just America, but the Americas a self-sustaining uh, sort of part of the world that doesn't rely on China. It's been a theme of Biden's foreign policy so far, doing everything we can to be self-dependent, not sort of a subject to the shocks of supply chains like we saw as a result of COVID. And President Biden is going to continue this focus when he returns to Washington now. On Friday, he's meeting with another world leader, the prime minister of Japan. NBC's Mike Memley for us in Mexico. Mike, thanks so much. Thousands of Brazilians took to the streets in protest on Monday, but this time the demonstrators were demanding jail time for the rioters that broke into government buildings in support of former President Jair Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro lost his election in October to the more liberal Lula, and his term came to an end on January 1st. As for the conservative former president, well, He's here in the U.S. in a Florida hospital for stomach pains. And now President Biden is facing calls to extradite him back to Brazil. Joining us now is NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas. Guad, what is the situation on the ground? Has cleanup uh, gone at all as we might have expected? And what punishment do you think that these rioters uh, might face here? 
Uh, Jake, well, the military intervened over the weekend. They've restored order in the capital in Brasilia. Uh, it's been two days now. And Brazil's justice minister has talked about the investigation and where they're at. Now, the first thing the military did was detain hundreds of pro uh, Jair Bolsonaro supporters who were camped out uh, a few miles from uh, the area where these federal buildings are at, right in front of military headquarters. These uh, protesters, mm. uh, Bolsonaro supporters, were attempting uh, to have the military overthrow Lula's government, uh, Lula da Silva, the new president. But of course, the military uh, disbanded that camp, and we know that hundreds uh, have now been detained. Now, what the justice minister in Brazil is saying is that anyone that broke the law will be prosecuted. They have not shared any specific information as to the charges that these individuals will face. What they've done is shared information on the investigation as a whole. One of the things that they say they want to find out is who was behind the protesters. They say that mm. someone paid for food, for water, for buses to transport a lot of these protesters into that area. And they believe it could have been individuals or businesses. This is something that the investigation is looking into as they continue uh, with their findings in Brazil. Jacob. And Guan, uh, you know, at this point, do we have any sense of, of how President Lula is responding? And I guess the larger question here is, can Brazilian lawmakers in any way head this off if, as this, as you say, this was a sort of, uh, you know, possibly an outside planned thing, uh, can they stop this in the future or is pro-Bolsonaro sentiment too strong? So, Jake, there's a few things. Uh, after this happened, uh, President Lula uh, said that uh, Jair Bolsonaro, the outgoing president, uh, shared some of the blame for what happened. Uh, Bolsonaro has, of course, uh, uh, been, as you mentioned, in Florida, and he tweeted indicating there's no proof to link him directly to these protesters. Uh, now, in Brazil, uh, another thing that the justice minister shared in his press conference was that there is no criminal investigation in Brazil that is linked to uh, Bolsonaro, which means there is no extradition possible or there's no elements for some type of extradition that would be requested by the Brazilian government to have Bolsonaro uh, be sent back to Brazil. That's one thing. Meanwhile, we do have an update on his condition. Uh, he was stabbed in 2018, and because of that, he's undergone a few surgeries. He shared information on social media yesterday indicating that he was uh, suffering from intestinal adhesions, and that's why he had been checked into a hospital here in Florida. Uh, but just minutes ago, we received video uh, from uh, Telemundo Network uh, showing that he has now arrived at the home in Florida where he had been staying, so he has been released from the hospital. Now, what we have to look for in the future now is when Bolsonaro would be returning to Brazil. Uh, earlier today, CNN Brazil Brazil reported that they interviewed him while he was in the hospital, and they say Bolsonaro indicated he planned to return to Brazil sooner than anticipated because he wants to see the doctors that have been treating, uh, treating him for those issues over the years. That's the last we know of him while in Brazil. As I mentioned, they continue with that investigation, but again, there is no direct link to Bolsonaro according to what's happening uh, in Brazil at the moment. Guad Vanegas with the complicated situation in Brazil. Thank you, Guad. After the break, more of the top stories that we are following this hour, including the ongoing nurses strike at two New York City hospitals. Plus, the former CFO of the Trump Organization is heading to jail tonight. And more shocking claims from Prince Harry about the royal family. That is all just ahead. Stay close. It's time now for some of the big headlines we're watching tonight. Students at the University of Idaho will return to the classroom tomorrow, nearly two weeks after an arrest was made in the murders of four fellow students. While classes were on break, police arrested Brian Koberger, a PhD candidate at the neighboring Washington State University. A public defender for Koberger says his client believes he'll be exonerated. Today, the Department of Education reintroducing a new option for repaying student debt. The student loan safety net was originally unveiled over the summer. If finalized, the plan offers lower monthly payments, an easier path to loan forgiveness, and a promise that unpaid interest will not be added to a borrower's loan balance. In Illinois, a statewide ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines is expected to soon become law. The House voting today to pass the Protect Illinois Communities Act, sending it now to Governor J.B. Pritzker's desk. Pritzker has previously vowed to sign the ban into law, which would make Illinois the ninth state to outlaw assault weapons. 
New Jersey and Ohio just became the latest states to ban TikTok from government devices. Calls removed the app picked up in November after FBI Director Chris Ray said it poses national security risks. More than 20 states have now imposed similar bans on the video sharing app. And it is the jackpot that just keeps growing. Tonight's Mega Millions prize is officially the fifth largest lotto prize in U.S. history, going now for $1.1 billion billion with a B dollars. And since no winner claimed the lucky numbers on Friday, that mega jackpot is up for grabs again in tonight's drawing. In New York City, thousands of nurses walked off the job for the second straight day of strikes. It all stems from pay and staffing. This is now the city's largest nursing strike in decades. Outside the hospitals, nurses are gathering with their red union hats and scarves. You see them there inside. A skeleton staff is struggling over its reduced patient loads. Nurses say their walkout has to do with improving patient safety. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard has more. This nurse's strike appears to be heading to now its third day of impasse as these two hospitals, one in Manhattan and one in the Bronx, continue to hold out on the demands of the Nurses Association here. It's not just about compensation, but from the nurses we've talked to, it remains, again, the commitment from these hospitals, these medical centers, to retain the nurses that are required in order, the nurses say here, to provide the appropriate care. The, we've heard from nurses who've said that in recent years, really largely since the pandemic, the nurse to patient ratio has only decreased here. And the amount of care that they are able to adequately provide has dwindled as a result of the lack of, uh, of staffing here. I want to let you hear from two nurses uh, here that we had a conversation with earlier today. Take a listen. It's very unsafe, and we're also about to go up for orientation, and we're, you know, new to the ED, so it's really concerning for us if we're going to be on this unit with this unsafe ratio. If we don't do this now, it's just going to keep getting worse, so it's best to just fight now, make a change so that this doesn't have to keep happening. Now, in the meanwhile, ambulances have been redirected here from these medical centers, and we've been told by a, a nurse who is actually still working inside that they are actually moving patients out now to other medical facilities here. Elective surgeries have also been ended. Uh, that is where there's a lot of question marks as to just how long this strike will continue and the extent to which it impacts the neighborhoods here in New York City and the care that they are able to receive from these two major hospitals. Back to you. Former Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg's first night at Rikers Island Jail begins this evening. A New York City judge sentenced him today to five months in prison for his role in the company's 15-year tax fraud scheme. While working for Trump, Weisselberg did not pay taxes on a bunch of benefits he received, like a rent-free apartment, expensive cars, and his grandkids' private school tuition. He pleaded guilty to these charges over the summer. NBC's Tom Witter joins us now from New York. Tom, I know you've been following this closely. As I understand it, he is uh, looking at five years possible probation. What are the consequences is he facing and does any of this come as a surprise to you? That's right. And as a matter of fact, no surprises here today, really, because unlike the federal system, the state system, the judge at the time of his guilty plea last August really essentially laid out the type of penalty that Weisselberg would be facing today. And that's why only a 20 minute hearing for him today. He was handcuffed at the end of it, his right hand taken into cuffs first, then the left. And then he was let out of the courtroom. He even expected to be taken to Rikers Island today, which we've just confirmed he is at as of this evening, uh, taken there. Uh, wearing essentially the most casual clothes possible, jeans, an untucked white T-shirt, in, in a uh, uh, hunter green or an olive type of North Face fleece jacket. That's what he arrived in court to today. And as far as this penalty, on top of this five-month jail term, on top of, as you mentioned, the five years of probation, he's also had to pay just over $2 million in fines, penalties, and back taxes for those benefits that you outlaid. So today, perhaps not a surprise, but today Today, perhaps a punctuation mark on this stage of the investigation, obviously a significant investigation involving the former president of the United States, his company, and now his CFO, his right-hand man, in jail here in New York City. From the very heights of Manhattan Business Society to bedding down in Rikers Island, I know it's not surprising to you, Tom, but it is pretty shocking to see. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the Trump organization itself is also scheduled uh, to be sentenced on Friday. What are we expecting there? 
Right. So obviously it's a corporation. You can't jail a corporation. You can't uh, drag some buildings uh, that belong to the former president's company over to Rikers Island. But you can make them pay a fine. And that's exactly what they're facing on Friday. Uh, just around $1.7 million is the maximum fine uh, that the judge can prescribe to the company. So that's what they're facing uh, this Friday. And then the question after that is, where does this all go from here? Does this investigation, which the district attorney says, is ongoing? Do we see new steps in that investigation? Do we see people uh, brought before the grand jury? Do we see uh, more subpoenas go out? Or is it a wait and see and, and figure out eventually where all this goes? Just a, a lot of questions here in the coming weeks. But this chapter involving the company and its books uh, appears, at least for the time being, as it relates to these specific crimes uh, wrapping up. You know, Tom, to just step back from this and think about a, a former president's organization being sentenced, his former CFO uh, going to Rikers, it is some shocking stuff. Anyway, Tom Winter uh, spending time on it for us. Thank you so much, Tom. Sure thing. It's been hotly anticipated and widely publicized, and now it is finally here. Prince Harry's autobiography, Spare, officially hit bookshelves today, but it's been making waves all week. Now, after just one day on the market, the memoir is already the fastest selling nonfiction book ever in the United Kingdom. Here's correspondent Rhiannon Mills from our partners at Sky News. The wait is over. Harry's highly anticipated and already heavily talked about book finally on sale around the world. Some in London even snapping it up overnight. I think is incredibly courageous and brave. He has created a historical record of his life. He lived it, only he knows what he kind of endured and went through, and it's the record for his children. I think um, he should have the right to say what he wants and he shouldn't be attacked for it. Everyone has their opinion and that just seems to be his. After it ended up in shops in Spain last week and that string of TV interviews, we already know about the fights with William his trauma at losing his mother, the drug taking in his early years and his anger with the press and his family for allegedly leaking stories, including criticism of Camilla. Hurtful claims about a woman loved by his father that make reconciliation seem even more remote. Those who worked for Camilla and the now king say the claims don't stack up. The notion that she may have leaked anything about her stepsons to make herself look better seems inconceivable. You might be surprised that the palace have remained so silent. At the moment, if anyone will pick up the phone, they are reluctant to say anything. And that's because the last thing they want to do is feed that image from Harry of underhand briefings from malicious staff. The royal family instead are happy to leave Harry to do the talking, as a wider audience now get to make up their own minds on the long-term repercussions for them and for him. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News. Thank you, Rhiannon. In school, did, did you ever dread writing an essay or wish someone else could do it for you? Well, now some schools are banning technology that literally does just that. After the break, a look at chat GPT. What is ChatGPT? Well, think of it like a Google that you can ask to do things. It's something you can essentially have a conversation with and uh, go back and forth with. Now, this new piece of artificial intelligence technology will also write term papers, software, even legal documents, all in a matter of seconds. But while it looks like an all-knowing robot brain, it's more like a gifted impersonator, one that learned to mimic what it has read on the internet. Now, with that sophisticated level of technology comes serious ethical concerns, and those are now being addressed in cities like New York. Last week, ChatGPT was banned from all city public school devices and systems. A spokesperson for the department says the technology harms students ability to learn, saying, quote, while the tool may be able to provide quick and easy answers to questions, it does not build critical thinking and problem-solving skills. So how does this technology work? Here's a short 101 on ChatGPT. Amar Reshi asked a computer program to write a book. I think it was write a children's book about a young girl who creates her own AI. And in a weekend, Alice and Sparkle was finished. Well, Sparkle was a magical AI that Alice created. Wow. Chat GPT is technology accessible and free to anyone on the web that impersonates what it's read on the internet. 
Type in a request and it can write legal documents, software, even school essays. People are predicting it will wipe out whole industries. Attorneys, realtors, are we going to be out of a job? But chat GPT as an AI system may pose ethical risks to users who are unaware of how the technology works. It in no way is reflecting the depths of human understanding or human intelligence. What it's really good at doing is mimicking its form. In fact, remember what I said earlier? But chat GPT as Well, I asked chat GPT to write that line for me. Users who are Then I asked for a knock knock joke. Knock knock, who's there? Chat GPT. Chat GPT who? Chat GPT careful, you might not know how it works. What parts of our society could this change? The valuing of work, of human creativity. There are concerns around deception and potential uses for fraud. But I think that that's sort of only the tip of the iceberg here. The company that makes ChatGPT, OpenAI, was co-founded by Elon Musk and is now primarily backed by Microsoft. The company declined our request for an interview. The kids Amar made the book for seemed to like it. But writers and illustrators on social media did not. There are some super valid concerns from these artists. After all, ChatGPT could wipe out his job, too. Literally my line of work, you know, uh, apps, uh, design work, um, your product design work. And now he wants someone to solve this problem. What are mechanisms we can still compensate artists? That's the lesson to you here. That, that's definitely the lesson. Here to discuss more is Stephen Marsh, contributor to The Atlantic. He is the author of this article, The College Essay is Dead, Nobody is Prepared for How AI Will Transform Academia. Thank you so much for being here. Now, let me ask you first. You. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really a pleasure. I want to hear your take on this because I'm thinking here about the perspective of teachers, right? And I'm thinking once upon a mm. time about a math teacher during the introduction of the calculator or a painting instructor during the introduction of photography. Why is this piece of technology different from those things? Well, I don't think it is that different. I think it's essentially what those things are, but for language. So what it allows any student to do is to, you know, answer a question in a very consistent way, maybe not an A way, but certainly a B plus way and get a sort of a reasonable answer to any question and do it in whatever form they ask it to do. My son, who's in high school, just told me that he asked a friend, have you done your biology assignment yet? And he said, no, I got AI to do it. And I think that's something mm -hmm. that every teacher is going to face. They're clearly facing it in New York, right? Well, that is the thing, right? And I, I also know that, you know, because Microsoft is the big backer of OpenAI, they have the, the first shot at commercializing it into products. And we've already heard reports that they're going to work it into Bing, their search engine, and they may even work it into Microsoft Word. And so I guess I'm wondering, from your perspective, is AI inevitable in the classroom or is there some way to head it off? Well, you know, personally, I don't think ChatGPT is even that great a large language model. I mean, I actually think like, it's the one that people notice, but like actually programs like PseudoWrite that use GPT-3 were capable of doing this, you know, for about, you know, a year and a half ago. And there are other programs like Cohere here in Canada that are large language models that are excellent, really, really excellent and capable of doing really incredible things. So yeah, this is coming. Um, I'm personally not afraid of it. I'm excited by it. I think it's going to be wonderful and glorious. And I think there's a, a, a great amount of hope to be found in this technology. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, a fear story to me, uh, but there's definitely going to be challenges for administrators, for sure. Well, art articulate for me your, your hope for it. What What is hopeful? You know, I'm thinking about a world in which somebody can, in theory, pass, you know, go, go past, you know, a certain level of education and no further and still be able to derive enormous amounts of writing out of a system like this. Why does it make you so hopeful? Well, I mean, did the, the pocket calculator didn't end math, right? And like the, the technologies we have for manipulating images did not end design, right? Like, in fact, in some ways, they kind of began the process. And I think what we're what we're seeing is that arrive with language. I mean, you know, I think one thing that's really interesting to think is that we've essentially taught children how to write like machines for for a couple of hundred years, um, and now I think we're that's going to be capable of being done by a computer. Maybe it's time to treat them how to write like human beings. Because, you know, this is just text prediction software. It's not capable of intention. You have to be able to guide it. It is really just a tool. So, you know, I think the, the idea that it's going to replace thinking, it's not going to replace thinking at all. It's going to replace a lot of boilerplate work. It's going to replace a lot of, you know, bland legalistic language that is going to be much more automated at this point. But, you know, I don't, I don't really necessarily see that as a, as a danger. You know, I think that might be a good thing. 
Well, it's certainly uh, an amazing new world and one in which perhaps we need to teach students at least what this thing is uh, before they begin oh, relying yeah. on it to do their homework for them. Stephen Marsh, uh, sure. contributor to The Atlantic, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. The Hollywood Foreign Press Association is asking for another chance. Last year's Golden Globes were scrapped from television over a lack of diversity. Before we go tonight, a look at the show and the big changes. The Golden Globes return to TV this year. NBC is airing the ceremony after not doing so last year. The Hollywood Foreign Press Association, which organizes the Golden Globes, is hoping to stay on the air after a string of controversies. Among them, two members resigned last year over accusations of bullying and an overall lack of transparency. One of tonight's nominees, Brendan Fraser, is not in attendance. He refused his invitation after accusing the group's former leader of sexual misconduct and a lack of diversity. For example, the organization had no black members in 2021. But there is one group gaining significantly more representation in the film industry, and that is LGBTQ enter entertainers. Host Gerard Carmichael will be joined by fellow LGBTQ actors, actresses, and producers either presenting or being nominated at tonight's ceremony. And a report from GLAAD found that the percentage of queer inclusive films has grown by 50% within the past decade. Here to discuss this with us is Dr. David Johns, uh, Executive Director of the National Black Justice Coalition. Dr. Johns, thank you so much for being with us. I, I want to ask that. you first, you know, I know you've been watching uh, as it, it's going on, uh, as, as I've been speaking here, you know, who are some of the nominees and, and winners that are, are jumping out at you? Uh, like the indomitable Issa Rae, I rooted for everybody black. And I have been recently excited by the fact that Quinta Brunson, uh, has earned her award, as well as Tyler James, uh, both on the acclaimed Abbott Elementary as a former elementary school educator. Uh, watching the show warms my heart, and to see them receive uh, the deserved accolades uh, also makes me feel really good. There are a number of other folks I'm super excited about, Nisi Nash Betts, uh, chief among them. Uh, but I'm really glad to see uh, the increase in diversity uh, on this year's program. And tell us a little bit about your reaction to, to years past with the Golden Globes and the controversies that have surrounded uh, them. And, and now watching it as you are this year, you know, is it surprising to you what you're seeing here? Uh, is it a departure from what you've seen in the past? Uh, uh, both and yes, yes and no. So I want to celebrate the progress that has been made. I want to honor the work of advocates like um, uh, April Rain, who started the Oscar So White campaign, who helped to shine a light on the lack of diversity, including in spaces like the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. I want to celebrate the work of my colleagues at GLAAD, who underscored, as you mentioned, the 50% increase over the last 10 years. 20% yeah. of the films that were released this year uh, featured LGBTQIA plus characters, and there is still considerable work to be done. Um, both with regard to ensuring that it is um, that there's more diversity with regard to LGBTQIA plus characters. The vast majority mm. of those on film are gay white men. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done in that regard. Mm. There's also work to be done to ensure um, that queer characters are portrayed by queer actors um, as well. There are still uh, so many uh, straight actors who end up sure. playing queer characters. Um, and then in addition to that, you mentioned the uh, uh, increase in diversity. Um, so we do know based on the data that has been shared um, that there are 103 uh, new voters, 10% of those voters are black, but the Hollywood Foreign Press Association has not released numbers about sexual identity, gender orientation, or expression. Uh, so there's yeah. still a lot more work to be done, especially when we think about intersectionality and centering the host, Gerard uh, Carmichael, who, as I am, is a black, same gender loving man. Well, I want to quickly, before I let you go, I want to show you a piece of research that I, for me has been a very mind-blowing thing to encounter, which is a Harvard study that has basically looked at 30 years of attitudes around prejudice in the United States. And it's basically the pulse of prejudice. And what it has found is that over time, anti-gay bias has in fact fallen off at a time when our uh, prejudices around gender uh, have barely moved, when our prejudices around race have barely moved, ageism, uh, disability, uh, if, if anything is going in the wrong direction. And so really LGBTQIA issues are the one place that Americans seem to be becoming more enlightened. I wonder if as someone who watches this space so closely, you think it's because of more and more representation and more and more positive portrayals in the entertainment we consume. 
Oh, absolutely. This has everything to do with media as a powerful tool in normalizing the beautiful diversity that has always existed uh, here in America and, and, and throughout the world. Um, I was recently at the Kennedy Center watching the documentary about Sidney Poitier produced by Reginald Hudlin and Oprah Winfrey, and it was not lost on me that he and so many other Black actors have done the work of normalizing our experiences. And so, uh, yes, it is notable and noteworthy uh, that media has provided for normalization in that regard, and there is still so much work to be done. I make the point um, uh, to, to connect to something I made previously that uh, every year for at least the last five years that I believe the National Black Justice Coalition has been the deadliest year on record for black trans women. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we think mm -hmm. about opportunities to increase representation beyond traditional portrayals of them as sex workers or as victims of homicide, uh, which is normally the portrayal when we think about um, uh, um, trans folks in particular, um, yeah. uh, increasing representations to normalize their diverse experiences could also help in that regard. Dr. David Johns helping us understand the long road we have traveled and how far we have to go. Thank you so much. That does it for us tonight. I'm Jake Ward for Now Tonight. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.